Hello and welcome to today's Euractive debate on CBAM, where we're asking how do we ensure that we cut emissions and don't just move them. My name is Dave Keating. I'm coming at you live from the Euractive studios in the heart of the EU quarter. Now today we're going to be talking about the EU's Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, CBAM, which was proposed by the European Commission in July 2021 to complement the EU Emissions Trading System, the ETS. Lots of acronyms here, so we're going to go slow for you. This goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions cost-effectively in line with the Fit for 55 objectives laid out last year. So products from the cement, aluminum, fertilizer, electricity, iron, and steel sectors will be subject to a charge if they're imported from a country that doesn't have as stringent climate legislation as the European Union. The purpose is to ensure that European industry can play on an equal footing with foreign manufacturers and to counteract the risk of carbon leakage, which will increase due to higher European carbon prices in the ETS. Now, in the long term, CBAM should gradually replace the free allowances distributed through the ETS up till now. The proposal would levy this charge only on imports, leaving exports untouched. This issue recently came up at the EU Council, but national governments agreed on this import-only general approach on CBAM and left the exports issue for a later stage. However, several European industries have expressed their concerns that CBAM only levels the playing field for imports and that no solution has been proposed for exports leaving the EU. And therefore, they're worried that this issue has been kicked into the long grass when they see it as really essential to deal with now. They also stress that there is a high risk that EU products would be replaced by more carbon-intensive products, which would be counterproductive. Some argue that as it stands today, under this proposal and this general approach, CBAM would hinder the reach of European industry in global markets. So today we're going to tackle this issue head on. Should CBAM take account of exports? And what is the best way to prevent carbon leakage and protect European industry from unfair competition? To discuss this today, we've assembled a panel of experts and policy makers. Welcome to all of you. Let me introduce uh, all of our panelists to you at home now. We have Pasquale D'Amico, who is in charge of economic and legal analysis of indirect taxation at the European Commission. We have Greek center-right MEP Maria Spiraki, co-chair of the European Parliament's Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development. We have Eileen Schaukett, Project Manager, Manager for Industry at the think tank Agora Energiewende. We have Benjamin Dunny, who is Senior Policy Advisor at the European Trade Union Confederation Industrial. And we have Luke Haustermans, Head of EU Public Affairs and Industry Relations at the Norwegian chemical company Yara International. Thank you to all of you for joining us today. We also are going to have a couple of uh, Slido poll questions for you guys, and I'd like to put the first one to you now, uh, just to get a feel for how you guys are thinking as we come into this debate. So that should be showing up for you right now if you're watching on Vimeo. So the question is, do you think that the export of EU low-carbon solutions can contribute to carbon neutrality? The answer would be yes, very much, yes but only marginally, or no. So how much do you think that the export of low-carbon solutions could contribute to global decarbonization? I'll give you guys a couple more seconds to answer that. Okay, so I will pull up those results now. So yes, a clear majority saying that these exports of these technologies would benefit the global uh, fight against climate change. So that's good to know that that's the, the mindset you guys are in coming into this debate. Of course, the, the essential thing we're going to be talking about today is how exactly that should be done and how these EU policies should be designed to make that happen. So Pasquale, let's, let's start with you. When the Commission was considering uh, this, this proposal and considering including an export mechanism in the CBAM, what was the thinking there when the Commission was considering whether to include exports in this or not 
in addition to imports. Thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you for letting me start. Uh, so here, if you look at our proposal, you will see why we have shaped the proposal without considering an express mechanism for the expert rebate. First of all, from an economic, then from a legal angle. From the economic angle, you will find in our impact assessment that the problem of expert is rather limited. Here we are talking about a 5% decline of uh, uh, export from the EU sector concern, which amounts to 4 billion in 2030, compared to a situation where we don't touch the free allowances. Now, this 4 billion will be largely compensated by a 9 billion decrease that we will have in imports. So there will be, according to us, the possibility to adopt an import substitution it means that our companies will have larger opportunities of exporting in the internal market because the reduction of the imports is larger than the export that we are going to lose in 2030. In the short term, so there is a gain. And in the long term, the gain will be even higher because our companies will enjoy a competitive edge. They will, be, where they will turn to clean energy and to clean technology before third country companies. So they will be a better place when in 13 years, we will have CBAM completely in, in force. Now, the legal assessment. I have seen several uh, legal considerations, some of them extremely interesting, but please consider that our legal assessment was done by the same people that defend us in the WTO. So we have involved a uh, line DG like DigiTrade and uh, the uh, Commission uh, Legal Services. And both, uh, both of them concluded that any system that includes forms of subsidies contingent in law or in fact upon export will, will be immediately countervailable. It means that if we apply such a system, a system of immediate export rebate, our export will be immediately countervailable. So you, we will lose our uh, short-term advantage with uh, tariffs that can be applied quite easily. You need only for five months for that on our export of the same products. So that's the reason why we have refrained from having an explicit system of uh, export rebate. But we have a specific mechanism for uh, inward processing. So it means that uh, uh, import the products when they are processed by European companies and uh, transformed in the EU, they can be re-exported without paying SIBA, as it happened with the VAT and with, with, uh, with the tariffs. So now I know that we are in the middle of the ordinary legislative procedure. So this is our proposal. We are looking with a lot of interest from the proposals coming from the European Parliament, because the Council, as you remember, stayed uh, quite uh, uh, on our same line. And when the Parliament will have his view, we'll be very happy to start uh, negotiations, trilateral negotiations, to find the, the best possible solution. So our doors remain open to companies and to members of the Parliament, and we are happy to have uh, your inputs in this debate. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. That's really interesting to know, especially the legal aspect of this, because of course that's a major consideration here. Uh, Maria Spiraki, let's turn to you next. How have members of the European Parliament reacted to the Commission's CBAM proposal so far? And what are some of the ways that MEPs have been looking to change the legislation? Thank you, Dave. Thank you for having me here in this very interesting debate. And uh, I will start from, from the point that uh, Pascal left concerning the situation on CBAM. I would like to say, first of all, a very brief uh, political comment uh, telling that uh, we are trying to provide the piece of legislation that supports the competitiveness of the EU industry and does not contain any kind of gray areas or windows of uncertainty because it is important after CBAM to provide stability and predictability to the investors. And by saying this, I would go straight ahead to our proposals coming from the ITRI committee on the, on the opinion that we have on, on this piece of legislation. First, in ITRI committee, we are proposing the extension of the administrative transition period by one year from 2026 to 2027 until 2027 after which the CBAM certificates will take effect. This is the, the first one amendment that I think that we will push on. And the second one amendment, which is also important, is that we are trying to provide 
a kind of uh, security mechanism, a safety mechanism, and uh, we are asking for establishing a safety mechanism, a temporary CBAM reserve, in order to provide uh, stability and predictability and a kind of support to, to our companies until we have fully implemented mechanism in terms of WTO. I think these are the two points that, uh, that we have to consider. We need time for adoption. We need also a safe area for adoption. And we need also to understand that there are a lot of concerns when it comes, for instance, for on, on one amendment which is saying that we can uh, uh, we can maintain the, the free allowances of 10% to the, to the front runners. I think this is a, 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 a case that we can debate further, but it is important to know that uh, all member states are not at the same level of competitiveness, that all member states are not facing the same challenges of competitiveness. I have the experience of my home country, Greece. We are very close to Turkey, to Albania, so we have different circumstances in terms of competitiveness on the, on the sectors that they are affected by SIBA. Thanks a lot. Eileen, let's turn to you next. So with the way that the CBAM proposal uh, exists so far, and particularly with it including imports but not exports, is there a risk that EU products could be replaced by more carbon-intensive products as a result of CBAM? Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and that's basically uh, at the heart of, of um, the most contentious issue right around, C around exports is that um, producers on the domestic market will face increasingly, um, as the CBAM is phased in and free allocation is phased out, will increasingly face the carbon price um, of the European ETS. So what that does, it increases the cost of production for domestic producers on the EU market. Um, but the problem is, of course, and we all know this, is that uh, these are a um, internationally traded uh, products. They are homogeneous, so they face uh, intense competition from other producers. And there's little ability to pass on this carbon cost, cost that you incur on the European market to these international markets. And um, the consequence would be then that you lose competitiveness internationally. And that if, and we, um, I mean, if you look at the data, this is sadly the case, or luckily the case, EU products are on average less carbon intensive um, under the, in the CUM sectors than the international average. So, if these EU products are then replaced internationally by um, dirtier production, then yes, we have an overall increase internationally on international markets um, in carbon intensity, and hence we have carbon leakage. Um, so the answer to this would be yes, there is a theoretical risk, um, or not not just theoretical, also factual risk um, that we that, that uh, EU products are replaced on international markets, but. Um, it's it's a matter of things that are happening at the same time, right? It's a, it's a matter of what is the speed of phase out. Um, we at Agora actually propose a slightly slower phase out of free allocation because it then allows companies to sort of have more time to, to transition. Um, also to to then basically have uh, right now as the, the commission has proposed, we have a 10% per annum um, phase in and phase out. We propose a 6% phase in and phase out, which would mean a reduction of 30% of free allocation in 2030. Um, that then is, uh, not 30%, not sorry, it's 24%. That is then more bearable um, for exporting uh, companies. Um, at the same time, we have efforts internationally, and we see this in the council proposal um, or in the council agreement now that there was a last minute um, addition of uh, making a reference to climate alliances. We will see more uh, international collaboration on creating lead markets for decarbonized products. So this is also a way to mitigate the risk to exporters because there will be different markets to sell these decarbonized products to that are more expensive, but cater to different segments of international markets, if that makes sense. So um, in, in short, there, there are ways to, to mitigate this risk. Um, within the CBAM design and through additional policy measures and international collaboration, um, but we need to get these things correct. Thanks, Eileen. Benjamin, we know that CBAM is, is a huge topic right now in Brussels, and it's going to affect a lot of different industries and a lot of different workers, and that's where you guys come in. How do trade unions view the issue of whether exports should be included in CBAM? 
thank you, Dave, and uh, thank you for for the invitation. Good good afternoon to to all of you. Let me first. Uh, step back a little bit and, and say that uh, trade unions have been supportive of the idea of a CBAM for many years now. And you might remember that the first MEP who brought the idea of a carbon border adjustment mechanism in an official uh, European uh, Parliament document was Edouard Martin, who uh, used to be uh, a famous uh, trade union leader from the steel sector before joining the, the member of the parliament. So for us, uh, having carbon border adjustment mechanism is clearly part of the jigsaw, the policy jigsaw, if we want as to have to, to speed up the decarbonization process, including for uh, our industry and more precisely uh, for uh, energy intensive industry. So that's why we have welcomed the uh, proposal made by the uh, European Commission in July 2021 with nevertheless some uh, concerns, some reservations, and one of them has to do with indeed the lack of uh, exports in the way the CBAM proposal has been designed. Why do we consider that uh, exports uh, should be in the scope of the CBAM from the outset? But because we, we consider that exports matter a lot for EU industry, including uh, for sectors under the scope of the CBAM, uh, for sectors like fertilizers, steel or aluminium, the share of exports in total EU production is between uh, 10 and 20, 22%. That share is even bigger, up to 30%, if you also consider EFTA countries. And if you look at specific uh, installations, that share can go up to uh, 50%. So not including exports in CBAM might expose EU industries to a significant risk of market losses, and that risk might entail negative consequences for employment in some in related sectors and especially in sites depending on exports for their profitability. And we have to keep in mind that energy intensive industries altogether, the ecosystem represents 8 million of jobs in the EU. And we also have to keep in mind that there is a huge diversity among member states when it comes to industrial competitiveness, industrial costs, and a strong uh, diversity also among sites. It's not because um, one multinational company got a um, significant amount of free allowances uh, 10 to 15 years ago, then, then that all sites in the corresponding sectors uh, is well protected against the risk of carbon leakage. We have to keep in mind that many sites have been sold during the last 10 to 15 years, and uh, that uh, specific situation must uh, be taken into account. Uh, an average, a macroeconomic average, can conceal huge differences among industrial sites in Europe, so that's why we want exports to be included in, in the CBAM. This is, in a nutshell, uh, my first uh, input to the debate. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Luke, let's turn to you next. What is Yara's take on the role of trade and the climate neutrality objective in the EU when it comes to this proposal? Uh, let me first maybe reintroduce Yara. Uh, after all, we are uh, a leading fertilizer company, so we are indeed uh, using chemical processes uh, to make our products, uh, but we also make organic fertilizer, uh, we sell precision farming tools, and we sell solutions to abate emissions from road transport and industry. Uh, I think from this debate, uh, we are actually quite representative of an international company with a strong base in Europe. So. We, uh, we have a Norwegian origin. Uh, we were based on an invention of 1905 uh, to extract nitrogen out of the air. And um, our majority of our production is still based in Europe, but we sell that product to 160 countries. Uh, for our European production base, 38% goes overseas. Uh, and that is, in our case, linked to the seasonality uh, of agriculture. We basically sell our European products to Europe when uh, the season in Europe needs it, and we sell it to the Southern Hemisphere, which is a very different market with smallholders uh, in developing countries uh, when the Southern Hemisphere needs uh, fertilizer. Um, the Aileen correctly ob observed that uh, European industry is on a decarbonization pathway, and that's absolutely necessary. Uh, in our case, we have reduced emissions by 45% in our production since 2005. 
and 57% in Europe. If you look uh, at that from another perspective, that basically means that the products we sell have a footprint which is significantly larger than global averages. In the case of nitrate fertilizers, we sell products which have a footprint which is half of global average. Uh, we operate in this international model um, and uh, we see that indeed the products with the lowest carbon footprint are at the risk uh, of becoming uncompetitive, especially in markets which are extremely price sensitive, such as agriculture. Um, our exports, as I said, are really uh, fundamental to our model. Um, and we think that adjustments are necessary. Uh, rising carbon prices do drive decarbonization. We do see uh, the, the need for uh, rising carbon prices as well to drive demand for our low carbon solutions. But we see that it needs to work uh, both ways, that you need an import adjustment, you, but you also need uh, solutions uh, for export. Uh, in, an, in our view, um, those solutions should not lead uh, to an uh, incentive to export, so it should not subsidize uh, the exports, but should maintain the current competitiveness on the global market. And that's also necessary because we want to continue decarbonizing, we want to continue investing uh, we have great opportunities with fertilizers based on renewable energy to decarbonize agri-food chain. We are working on green ammonia to decarbonize uh, the shipping sector. Uh, and we basically need an enabling framework to continue operating as a global company uh, and to continue attracting uh, investors. So that's really the way how we look at it. We see that trade is a necessity for our own decarbonization pathway. Thanks, Luke. So now we've heard the takes, the initial takes of all of our panelists. Let me put another question to you in the audience via the Slido poll. So do you guys think CBAM will impact EU industry's competitiveness of low carbon solutions in global markets? Now that's CBAM as it's currently constituted in the proposal, not what you'd like CBAM to be, CBAM as it exists in the proposal, uh, will it impact EU industry's competitiveness for low carbon solutions in global markets? I'll give you guys a little while to answer that. In the meantime, I'd like to put uh, another question to Pascual. So, Pascual, the, the CBAM proposal, when we're, when we're looking at you know, the purpose of CBAM, which is to create a, a level playing field and make sure that European companies aren't disadvantaged, um, do, you th do you think can a real equal footing between European producers and foreign manufacturers be ensured if CBAM doesn't include a solution for exports leaving the EU? Does the non-inclusion of exports present a problem to that equal footing? Thank you so much, Dave. So first of all, let me address your question. Your question is not correctly formulated. The aim of CBAM is not to address the level playing field. This is the aim of trade policy instruments. This is the aim of anti-dumping, of anti-subsidy, of safeguards, not of CBAM. CBAM is a climate instrument. Its a sole objective is a climate one. Okay, that's the first point. Second point, of course, when we ask that the imports are subject to the same carbon price of European companies, somehow we are imposing to imports the same standard, the same uh, standards that our companies have. So indirectly, we may have this uh, uh, effect of level playing field that you mentioned. But I repeat, it's only indirect. And what is the demonstration of that, the fact that the CBAM is only a climate instrument? is in Article 9, in the fact that the CBAM takes into account carbon price paid abroad, it's also in the other international flexibility, which is the fact that we take into account the carbonizing effects, the carbonizing efforts made in third countries. So the cleaner a product, the less the adjustment it will pay. So this should be clear. Now, we will take, a, we will tackle the, uh, the loss of uh, exports Yes, we will do that uh, through the only legal angle that is possible, and it is green subsidies. There is a debate in the Council and there is a debate in the Parliament on how to better use uh, green subsidies, and I refer to the Innovation Fund. So here there are legal language that the Parliament suggests. There is a legal language that the uh, Council is also considering, and uh, in the end uh, this will be the system because we are not, we cannot push on export but we can help European companies 
to change their production, what the Yara company is doing as they admit themselves. So we help you through the decarbonizing path. And in that way, we can help you in the production together with export. But we cannot isolate export from production. That would result into a prohibit subsidies, what we have to avoid. We, we have a couple of red lines. One is this one, and the other is the double protection. I saw a lot of proposals, some of them extremely interesting, coming from the European Parliament, and I am sure that the Commission will take them into account. But we have to avoid to, uh, to fall into some legal traps and uh, in some economic traps, because being countervailed after the export is not in the interest of the European companies. So I hope it is clear, but I'm ready to reply to other questions in that sense. Thank you. So Maria, Pasquale just mentioned there are some of the suggestions that have come from the European Parliament and also that there, there are some legal considerations here, of course. Um, what, maybe I could get you to respond to some of what Pasquale was saying. Do you share those concerns about needing to be careful here when you're thinking about exports? Of course we need to be careful. And of course, we need to avoid overlapping in terms of subsidies and allowances. It is, it is obvious. And we are not working in this kind of framework. But it is important to say that, of course, SIBAM is not a trade-off instrument. It is a climate instrument. It is, in a way, a complementary with ETS by providing certificates to the, to the imports. But it is important to say that it is not something which is perfect. And that we are working on the proposal of the Commission in order to, uh, to raise some kind of issues that should be included in the final uh, uh, legal framework. And allow me to say that uh, we have to take into account the issue of the indirect cost. And uh, let, me, let me pose a question to our Yara representative here in, in this debate. Is it important or not, particularly on the chemical industry? It is also important to cover the full uh, value chain on the issue of the of the indirect cost, and not only the part of the production here here in in the in the European Union. It is also important to take a look to the collateral carbon leakage, not only to the to the obvious carbon leakage that we face. And of course, uh, I fully agree with Pasquale, but we have to take into account that now we are in the pipeline of decarbonizing our industry. And there is no room for backtracking. There is no room for sending some kind of fragmented messages to the markets. It is important to send a clear message to the market. We are now trying to have an instrument which is complementary to ETS, which is trying to decarbonize our industry, and it is also trying to facilitate the other uh, countries, the third countries, to, to go ahead and to, to work complementary with the European Union. That's why and this is the example of the electricity market. When we import electricity from third countries, then we take into account the way that they are trying to produce electricity. And if they are ready to, to go ahead with some green solutions, then we exclude the part of the green solution from, from, the, from the CBAM. And it is important to know this kind of parameter as well. Let me pull up the results of the survey now. So those should be visible now on your screen. So we know that, Pasquale, you were explaining that this is a climate piece of legislation, and that is the main intent. However, 70% of the audience does feel that it would have a direct impact on EU industry's competitiveness uh, for good or for bad. We don't know, but it does have a, a big impact on how European companies will compete around the globe with foreign companies. Luke, let me get your reaction to this, the, the audience survey here. Uh, and also, you could ask, uh, answer the question from Maria on the fertilizers. Yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, yes, uh, CBAM is a climate instrument. Otherwise, it would not work in WTO terms. Uh, you you uh, raise a levy on a product which is physically identical when arriving at the border. So I fully agree with you on that point. Uh, that, for in our view, also means that it's a climate instrument that you can op optimize. Uh, after all, the goal is to uh, reduce global emissions. It doesn't matter where they happen, they need to go down uh, globally. Um, on the point of innovation subsidies, two comments. Uh, first of all, the obvious one, everybody knows that the innovation fund is heavily oversubscribed, both in the reality of uh, project calls and in the reality of the political debate where lots of people want to use it for a variety of purposes. 
And that is the, the obvious one, but still it's an important tool. Our own project in Norway is partially funded by the Norwegian government, and that makes a significant difference in making it feasible. On the other hand, if you start directing uh, subsidies to sectors which are export intense, for whatever purpose, you kind of risk falling in the same trap as uh, with uh, subsidies for other purposes. So we don't see this as the only solution. Uh, on the point of the value chain uh, raised by MEP Spiraki, yes, uh, this is equally important. Uh, we need to find a solution so that our customers and that value chains continue working uh, in a competitive manner. Uh, and this is clearly the case for our industry where we often uh, deliver raw materials, which are then used in a lot by a lot of actors before it becomes a final product. Um, on the indirect costs, the answer is a bit nuanced. For us as an industry at the moment, we are very energy intensive, but it's gas-based. So we are not directly affected now, but our trajectory is to go to electricity, to renewables. So we need a solution. It's not as urgent for certain other sectors, such as the aluminum sector. But yes, we do see that coming. And in our case, it will enable our decarbonization. Eileen, let me put this question also to you. Do you think that uh, when, when European companies are competing with foreign companies, uh, especially if they're export-driven companies, is it, does, is it going to make a big difference whether exports are somehow addressed here? Um, yes, yes and no. So and there's, there's, there's a couple of ways to, to answer this question. It really depends on the speed of phase out that we will end up with, right? So depending on um, whether we have a slower phase out then actually the exposure that we will that that export driven com uh, companies will face by 2030 might not actually be as high as it is stated now we also see a lot of international reaction to the CBAN proposal where there are several other countries who have at least raised the idea of maybe at some point passing their own border carbon adjustment as well um, introducing carbon pricing more ambitiously so the, the world will change um, in the process of phasing in CBAM and phasing out free allocation and internationally phasing, phasing in um, more ambitious carbon pricing or other um, environmental policies. So those things are happening. Um, I agree with Pascal, what Pascal initially said, is that a European uh, industry that decarbonizes early on can have an, a competitive edge internationally by being the first to roll out these, these um, types of new climate neutral technologies at a large scale. So this can be a competitive edge internationally, um, especially as we look at, when we look at, at COP last year, for example, there were a lot of announcements by different kinds of actors, public actors, private actors, public private initiatives um, for procurement targets and um, green public procurement quotas um, by governments. There's a lot of initiatives uh, currently underway, and as you know, the Germans are really pushing this as part of the G7 um, to, to come together and um, sort of ha have a concerted effort to uh, have milestones for, for industrial decarbonization. So if if we manage to get this international collaborative agenda off the ground, and there's already some very great initiatives, then there will be lead markets who will buy these decarbonized products. Without these lead markets, yes, I agree, there's um, significant risk that the decarbonized products cannot compete on international markets because they're more they're more expensive but we see a lot of downstream companies like car companies saying they want to decarbonize their value chains they want to procure green steel for example um, but there is demand for decarbonized products so in in a way there's an opportunity on international markets and so the competitiveness uh, of Exporters will be impacted internationally through CBAM, but it can even be, it can be, it, it cr can create the momentum internationally to really take these green lead markets uh, seriously. So um, yeah, um, can go both ways <laughs> depending on yeah. um, sort of how seriously we take this international collaboration. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting perspective that it will have an impact, but what impact we don't know, and even when we don't really know, could it be positive or negative? Um, Benjamin, let me put this to you also. Uh, when we're particularly looking at export-oriented companies, export-oriented member states, what is the, the proposal as it stands without addressing exports going to mean for them if exports are not addressed? 
Well, it depends a bit on uh, which specific uh, sector we are talking about. It depends a bit on uh, what specific industrial sites we are talking about. Um, among our, our membership, uh, there are a lot of concerns in some part of the, the industry. Um, of course, in, in many sectors, uh, the current situation is uh, exacerbating the concerns uh, in terms of uh, the impact of energy prices and commodity prices on industrial competitiveness. So it makes, uh, to be honest, the discussion on, on, on CBAM a little bit less, um, how to say, burning than, than it was a, a few months ago for, for obvious uh, reasons. Um, but the, the, the key thing for, for, for us is, is really uh, to, to keep in mind that um, uh, an average um, is not the whole story. When I heard earlier today that uh, the uh, only impact of CBAM on exports would be a decrease of uh, 5%, even though I, I read uh, 6 to 7% in the um, uh, Commission Impact Assessment, um, we, we have to, to, to uh, also have a more granular uh, approach and, and, and picture of, of the situation to really know where the possible problems might be. Uh, as I said, some industrial sites have been sold, sometimes due to um, EU competition law. Some industrial sites in Europe are already struggling with uh, serious liquidity issues. Um, if uh, those sites are export oriented, if you uh, do not apply a uh, kind of, of CBAM for, for them, it might really be detrimental to their, their margins, to their competitiveness. And uh, we all know that in an open economy, uh, those kind of uh, issues sooner or later are translated into uh, employment problems. So that's, that's why we, we believe that we also uh, need to have a much more granular uh, debate to really know where uh, the possible problems might be. And so far, we only have very general uh, macroeconomic uh, quantitative assessments, uh, but we, we need more granularity in the debate. Yeah, thanks, Benjamin. I'm, I'm glad that you brought up the current challenges that we're dealing with, because that's what I wanted to ask about next. Uh, we know that the world has changed a lot since this proposal came out. So, Maria Spiraki, let me put this question to you, because just because of the timing of this proposal, it's now falling to the co-legislators to take into account the current challenges we're facing with energy prices, with supply chain problems, with uh, commodity prices, with inflation. Um, what are the implications for the CBAM proposal of all of these things that we're dealing with right now, um, with the current geopolitical context and the concerns, also on global food security? How is the Parliament taking these developments into account? Well, uh, let me give you the HOPEX uh, 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 insisting on two parliaments that I think they are also important. We face a twin crisis, meaning that uh, we are facing the, the COVID crisis and the pandemic and the consequences of the pandemic. And at the same time, we are facing the consequences of the Russian invasion in Ukraine. So uh, we, are, we are facing soaring prices on, in, on the energy sector. And we are now working on how shall we finally uh, eliminate our dependency on Russian gas and oil. And by saying this, I think that the CBAM is a very good opportunity to, to, to open the public dialogue on, on the issue of, the, of our strategic autonomy and also on the instruments that we have available in order to, to address uh, our goal on, on, in terms of strategic autonomy. It is very critical, according to my opinion, to, to, to send clear messages to, to the investors that we are determined, that we are committed to our scope to decarbonize our economy by 2050. It is the, the Green Deal target, and it is also uh, the Green uh, Deal purpose in order to streamline our investments for decarbonizing our economy. So by saying this, CBAM is a facilitator. At the same time, we need to understand that there is the reality, as uh, our uh, uh, panelists uh, have already underlined, and we have also to face the reality in terms of time and in terms of, of, uh, of opportunities to adapt. In this regard, we have to invest heavily in, the, in innovative solutions and uh, encouraging and incentivize the industry to invest in, in innovative solutions in order to reduce the, the energy cost and the decarbonizing cost. 
And also, it is also important to understand that maybe we need some more time, the period, the, the transitional period, which I have already mentioned on the internal opinion, in order to facilitate industries to adapt. I think these are the two parameters that we can face. And of course, because I, I'm not trying to, to avoid your question when it comes to the to the for global food security, and also it is also important to understand that fertilizers, one of the of the sectors that the uh, sebum is affected, are key for for, uh, for for securing our our food supply and in this regard i think that uh, this is also the, the the right moment to consider the the time the, the time provided the time the time needed in order to adapt also the fertilizer industry but not also not only the fertilizer industry it is the, the cement sector which faces a lot of issues when it comes to to the way that we we reconstruct our our uh, our our continent is also our, our neighborhood in Ukraine, and it's also the, the steel sector, it's also the, the iron sector, it's also the electricity. So we need some more time, we need some specific instruments in order to secure it, uh, to, to, to provide security and stability to the investors, and it is also important to invest heavily to innovative solutions. Pasquale, how future-proof was this proposal when the Commission put it forward? Obviously, uh, you guys couldn't have seen completely what was going to happen. Um, and with what you've seen in terms of the co-legislators um, adjusting to some new realities, is the commission comfortable with some of those adjustments? And does the commission have a view on how or if the CBAM proposal needs to be adjusted for these new developments? Well, thank you for the question. Of course, uh, our proposal uh, uh, can be improved and uh, we are uh, uh, working with the co-legislators uh, in these regards. There, has, there are a lot of ideas from the parliament and uh, once we have a final view, we will be ready to enter into negotiations. We already have the views of the, of the council. Our, our assumption is that by the end of the year, the main legislation will be completed and then we'll start working on the secondary legislation. Now, at the same time, what is very interesting, it was mentioned by uh, Aline, I think, uh, the, the proposal is being debated at the international level. We are having bilateral discussions, multilateral discussions, and plurilateral discussions. That's because the CBAM allows as two specific flexibilities. It takes into account the carbon price paid abroad, and it takes into account the uh, efforts of the carbonization. So this is why we are in the middle of discussions with third countries, in order to avoid a strong shock on their export. What is very important to stress was also mentioned by Map Spiraki. That's the very important point. We need predictability and we need a clear trajectory. This is, a, this is the most important part of a CBAM because without investment, we cannot have a CBAM. That's true for our companies. That's true for third country companies because the CBAM allows a lot of time, at least in the proposal that the Commission has put forward. I don't know if the, the, the parliament in the end will agree on a longer staging in period. It is possible. In any case, we are open to discuss that. I think it's something for the end game. But what is extremely important is to allow companies time and the resources to invest. If they know clearly that CBAM will be fully into force in 15 years, the problem of export, which is a short term problem, won't exist anymore because we will enjoy this competitive edge that Eileen recognizes as well. But thank you so much for all your inputs. This is a bit our view, and all these inputs are useful in order to improve this proposal. Well, you mentioned Eileen, so I'll go to Eileen next. I know at Agora Energy Venda, you guys have been uh, really analyzing these uh, changes, particularly to the, the energy prices and the, the changes in the energy landscape we're looking at. Um, how do you think the CBAM, does the CBAM proposal need to be adjusted, taking into account these recent changes? And if so, how? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, really good questions. I mean, I'm, I'm not the expert on the energy markets, that's uh, the energy team, but uh, happy to, to still talk on this. Um, I mean, one thing that is very um, obvious and that will be a key, I mean, this is a, this is a big problem, is that um, actually natural gas in the industrial transition has been sort of a, a bridge technology or has been seen as bridge technology to decarbonize. So, for example, in uh, steel, uh, you have the DRI technology, which you can operate basically with green hydrogen. Once you have green hydrogen, it's not commercially available. So the, the gas bridge is basically um, the, the segue to this. Um, 
given the gas prices, this narrative obviously now is problematic. Um, the CBAM itself, or the narrative, or the the, the sort of raison d'être for the CBAM does not change um, given the crisis. And I I have to be a bit cheeky and um, correct. Uh, I mean, Piper Spiraki there, because uh, we, we don't just have a twin crisis of, of, of a pandemic and of the war, we have a triple crisis of also the climate crisis, and, and that's very real. Um, we we have been looking at um, some sort of the investment cycles that European industry is facing, and this change, and these investments need to happen in 2020. So it doesn't, if, if you look at the, the industrial side, they need the free investment now, they need the clear signal now that, uh, that uh, decarbonized processes are actually uh, competitive vis-a-vis -vis um, uh, the conventional technologies. And um, hence, we, we need this framework right now. And um, yeah, the, the, the need for the CBAM is, is, is thus still very present, and, and we need to move forward with this policy package. Um, Luke, what about this question of global food security? How does that intersect with CBAM? <laughs> Um, we as Yara, our CEO, came immediately uh, out when the U Ukraine invasion happened to first of all condemn the invasion, but also to raise this issue of food security. Uh, the Russia and uh, Belarus have become extremely dominant in the fertilizer export sector, ranging uh, for certain nutrients having a 20% share of exports up to 40% in the case of potash. And that is simply not healthy for a robust system. Uh, we need a domestic industry, but we are also not arguing for autarky. We should have uh, a better balanced system where more regions are trading and uh, delivering fertilizers to the regions which need it most at the right moment because there are operational problems or there is a crisis. And I think from that side, we need to look again at CBAM uh, and see how our uh, trading partners look at it, but also redo some of the analysis because some of the trade flows will change because of this crisis. Uh, Benjamin, what do, you, what do you make of this issue of how and whether the proposal should be adjusted to these new developments? Um, actually, we, we um, indeed uh, consider that um, we might have entered into a completely new uh, reality. So it's true for, for CBAM, but it's true also for Fit for 55 and, and probably for all the EU pieces of legislation. But we believe, we still believe that the Euro European Green Deal, even though uh, far from being perfect, uh, notably on the social side, uh, we still believe that the Green Deal is the right policy tool because it will accelerate the uh, EU, um, uh, let's say, um, energy, um, if not dependency, at least uh, reducing our dependency uh, from uh, from uh, from imports. Um, but I also uh, would like to to stress one one aspect that we didn't uh, touch uh, so far, which is the need also to ascribe a significant role to private companies in bridging the financial uh, the financial and investment gaps. Um, we have seen um, a couple of months ago many multinational companies from sectors covered by the ETS and therefore covered by the CBAM announcing historical financial results, including massive dividends uh, distributed to shareholders, uh, while the same companies are asking for receiving again and again more public money to help them to uh, invest for the transition towards climate neutrality. Uh, we would like actually that money distributed to shareholders to be a bit more recycled into the real economy, to invest in sites, in, um, in industrial installations, in infrastructures, uh, because we believe that this is the best means to achieve climate neutrality and uh, keeping the related uh, jobs in the e European industries. So industry, private companies have a significant role to play in bridging the investment gap. It must be reminded and um, free allowances, CBAM and state aid to compensate indirect costs shouldn't be seen as blank check that are used by companies to simply increase the dividends they pay to their shareholders. This is an important point for trade unions. Thanks. So let's take some questions that have come in from the audience. And a reminder, you guys can ask your questions using Slido. I'll read them out to the panelists. We've had two questions come in that are similar, so I'm going to ask them at the same time. And Pascual, this, these questions will be for you first. So the question is from Paolo Falcioni. 
Is it not, it's, it's not just the exports that are at risk. It's the manufacturing in Europe that would be even at a higher risk using raw materials subject to CBAM, having to deal with a higher raw material cost. How do we tackle that extremely relevant issue? Similar question from Alvaro Vilas from Aplia. CBAM ETS will suppose more expensive materials for EU complex goods manufacturers, whereas third country manufacturers will not face such additional costs. Therefore, EU complex goods will have a competitive disadvantage. How can we guarantee a level playing field that prevents carbon leakage? So uh, would you agree, Pasquale, that, that there is a, a competitive disadvantage there? Thank you so much for the question. Both are uh, extremely relevant. Uh, actually, as you know, we have chosen certain sectors in CBAM also because of the feasibility of the control, because we are launching a new system. It's the first time in history that we are checking emissions in goods. So far, emissions were only checked in the, uh, in the facilities. So we need to set a system. We need to set a methodology. And the methodology can only work in the beginning with simple products. Now, we want to extend that in the future to more complex products. And I recognize the problem, because Apple already brought this problem to us, that you may have in the long run, because remember, CBAM is a long run measure, you can have an increase of costs if we make these products costing more. However, there are proposals in the parliament, and uh, Mrs. Piraki will, uh, will, will maybe describe them, on how to take into account downstream products. This is something that uh, we know will come from the parliament. We are ready to discuss this uh, aspect, and we are very open to find solutions. Remember, CBAM is for the first time here on the table, and we are setting something new. So the system should be workable. It cannot be too complex to be unmanageable, also because it would increase costs for companies. So ready to, to listen to, to your uh, problems, ready to look into the real impact of costs on the, of the uh, CBAM products in your final uh, products, and ready to help if it is the case. Thank you so much. Benjamin, you wanted to come, on, come in on this as well? Yeah, sure, because as, as uh, industrial trade union, we, we present um, a lot of workers from industrial manufacturing sectors, automotive, shipbuilding, aerospace, defense, and all those sectors uh, are um, concerned by uh, the possible impact of, of CBAM and ETS reform on uh, their competitiveness. Uh, let's let's be let's be let's be clear. Um, and um, I, I appreciate what uh, has been just said by uh, the representative of uh, the European Commission, Pasquale. Um, and I think that this is the really minimum we might we might have in the the, the, the CBAM uh, um, um, uh, instrument. Uh, is to have um, manufacturing sectors, including in the review clause, with a, uh, a specific monitoring uh, to to see what the impact will be and uh, a possible legislative proposal if if needed. But timing matters, and we cannot wait until the problems appear to react. If we wait for too long to monitor and to propose something, we might have lost uh, the industry. And we all know uh, that once an industry has left, it's extremely complicated to get it back in in Europe. So this is also a strong message we have. Pay attention to the consequences for manufacturing sectors downstream the value chain. But I'm sure that uh, Pasquale uh, is uh, aware of our arguments on that. Maria, how, what are some of the ideas in the parliament to deal with this issue of um, raw materials being subject to a higher risk? A lot of ideas. I think the main, the main issue here is that the commission is open to adapt and it is open to adapt it to to reform the 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 first the, the first draft of CBAM. It is also important to understand that we have now a, a basic uh, compromise coming from the council. But uh, allow me to, to to insist on this: we need to have CBAM as soon as possible. We need to have an implementable CBAM, not something that it will create a further problem that it can resolve. And of course, we need to, to send a clear message to the investors. And I insist on it because I have already heard from our panelists that there is a lack of investments. Allow me to, to, to give you some numbers. Last year, venture capitalists around the world invested $11.9 billion in renewables energy compared with $30.1 billion in cryptocurrencies and blockchain, according to Pittsburgh. So we need to increase our attractiveness 
in terms of decarbonization, in terms of EU pro the project of decarbonization, and also in terms of greening our production and in terms of creating a green market. And in this regard, we need CBAM. We need CBAM taking into account but we have also to safeguard the competitiveness of the domestic industries and not to oppose discriminatory treatment. And that's why I think that it is a political progress from hearing from the Commission that they are open to, to reconsider the, the issue of CBAM when it comes to raw materials and to our proposals coming from Parliament. Let's take another question from the audience. This comes from Justine Roynesdal. Uh, it's another question uh, for the Commission. So how will the Commission avoid that the inward process solution remains a loophole? So how, how will it avoid that the inward process solution is a loophole in CBAM that allows the EU processing industry to use carbon intensive raw materials from third countries instead of low carbon materials produced in Europe? Pasquale, do you have thoughts on that? Yes, thank you so much. This, uh, uh, there is a specific provision in Article 2 of the proposal about uh, the inward processing. So inward processing is an institute that already exists in the, in the custom law, and uh, it is uh, extended to CPAM. Now, what we will avoid, and that's the security valve that we have enclosed here, is that after processing products that are meant for inward processing, which means that they should be re-exported, actually some of these products can remain in the internal market. And in that case, we have established in Article 2 that they will pay CBAM. So this would avoid circumvention of, uh, of CBAM. Plus, we have specific rules on circumvention in Article 27 uh, of the proposal and specific, specific penalties still in Article 26 of the proposal. So the system is made to be strong. And I know that uh, other proposals are coming from the parliament to make the, uh, the anti-circumvention system stronger. So it's, uh, it's in, our, uh, in our hands, in, but in hands of the, of the co-legislators too, to help in strengthening the system. But of course, we will avoid any abuse of the, of the CBAM system. Thank you. Luke, what are your thoughts on this inward processing issue? Uh, inward processing for Yara as a global company is an important mechanism. Uh, we operate a production system which is uh, global and which uh, exchanges products uh, and half finished products between all the sites. Uh, and on a yearly basis, uh, having this flexibility via inward processing is really important, but it has shown itself extremely important now during the periods when gas was unaffordable. We kept basically producing cost efficiently our fertilizers because we were able to effectively import uh, ammonia into Europe. So in that sense, uh, yes, there should be measures, but they exist in inward processing to avoid that this becomes an environmental loophole. That since inward processing already exists for a long time, this consideration has been made in the past, but it's another mechanism that keeps global trade connected. Thanks, Luke. So let's go to another question from the audience here. Um, I'm going to take, put this to Maria Spiraki. So this question is from Wilhelm Klumper from DBV. How do you evaluate the idea of the German government and others to push for a climate club of like-minded country to build a common CBAM and to work towards integrating all of their ETSs? So in other words, CBAM wouldn't be necessary in this kind of bubble of countries that are agreeing to make sure their climate policies are equal. What do you think of that idea, Maria? It is, first of all, a political proof that CBAM is needed. And CBAM is necessary in order to complement ETS. But allow me to say that we have a mature market here in the European Union. So we have to, to do our best uh, at home by, by starting working uh, with 27 member states in terms of, uh, of, uh, of common market at the same time, putting our standards to the inputs coming from third countries. That's why we need CBAM. We need CBAM to put standard. We need CBAM to facilitate third countries in order to, to green their production. And it is important also to incentivize third countries in order to reduce uh, the CBAM pricing in, in the, to, to the products that we import in the EU. So I think that, of course, it is, it is something that it can work, 
but I prefer the European solutions in uh, the European issues, and I think that uh, we have to maintain the European leadership in terms of tackling climate change and protecting the environment, and also uh, not only protecting, but also maintaining the competitiveness of our industries in terms of transition and, uh, and greening them. Eileen, what do you think about this idea of having a CBAM club? Yeah, um, so we, we've seen a number of proposals in, in, in recent year um, around uh, collaborative action. Um, how, what could a climate club or climate alliance do and how, how does it fit together with the CBAM? Um, so basically, the, German, the Germans first launched this idea of having this climate club, um, which is now pushed um, as part of the G7 agenda. And it basically took up an idea that was uh, initially um, floated by or, or a proposal made by the IMF of an international carbon price floor. Um, the idea first was to basically um, reduce the need for unilateral action by just the EU um, and make it more collaborative action where a lot of countries come together and have the same carbon pricing. The idea being if everyone, if we have you know, universal carbon pricing, then there's no risk of carbon leakage, right? Um, so I think what what the the question is what are we trying what do we need what what does industry need to decarbonize in the short run what is realistic and what are we trying to achieve so industry um in the short run um needs global lead markets to buy these decarbonized products that are not cost competitive vis-a-vis -vis, um dirty production routes or conventional product pr production routes um, yes, while well, it would be really great if we would all have the same universal carbon pricing, it's it's just something that's not going to be um, mandated in the or it's not going to not not, not going to be something that we can agree on on an international level in the short term. Um, and we're talking really short term. What what can we do until 2030? Um, so while it would be a medium term goal to achieve something like this um, in the short term, it's just not something that we should really. Um, prioritize in international collaboration. There are other things that need prioritization, um, namely creating lead markets together. So this idea of also linking together um, carbon pricing system, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it, will, it would, sounds nice on a theoretical level, right? But how practicable is it? If we have different schemes, we have a cap and trade scheme in Germany, we have other taxation-based um, carbon pricing uh, in other countries. So these systems are very different and linking them together is gonna to be an administrative headache and, uh, and very difficult. So while it's a nice theoretical idea, we should really be focusing on what does industry need in the short term from international collaboration, what's, what's feasible and reasonable and then and do that. Benjamin, you wanted to come in on this as well? Yeah. Um... Yeah, as Eileen just said, we, we have seen uh, different proposals when it comes to carbon clubs, carbon alliances with different scopes, different aims, different composition. Uh, what we would like to remind is that um, whatever the kind of climate club or climate alliance we are talking about at global level and might have an important role to play, we still consider that CBAM is needed uh, because uh, at this stage, uh, the EU is among the very few major uh, economies having an effective carbon price. Um, and it will be even more true after the ETS reform. Um, we will have a, a carbon price system which uh, really bites, which is really uh, delivering some, some results, some impact on, on industry and hence uh, the need to have the, the CBAM to equalize the, the CO2 cost uh, between uh, EU uh, industries and their competitors on, on EU and on, on, on global markets. Uh, now, I, I believe that those um, clubs or alliances uh, have a role to play, indeed maybe to uh, contribute to create lead markets, to harmonize uh, procurement policies among, among countries, also uh, to have um, kind of policy convergence uh, regarding uh, carbon pricing systems, also to facilitate uh, technical exchange to uh, connect and link the different systems. But again, it shouldn't be seen as an alternative to CBAM. For us, it must complement the CBAM also to facilitate a global uh, buy-in, a global acceptance of um, the kind of um, mechanism that uh, CBAM is just uh, an example. Um, thanks, Benjamin. So I'm going to take a next question from the audience for Pasquale. So this question is coming from Martin Menner from CEP, and it has to do with 
basically whether free allowances need to be phased out uh, when CBAM comes in. Uh, Martin says, free allocation to all installations under CL risk is not challenged by the WTO. It protects exports, provides decarbonization incentives, and can prevent carbon leakage within a carbon club together with a carbon consumption tax at the level of the minimum CO2 price of the club. Uh, doesn't it? Um, uh, he goes on to say, uh, why hasn't the commission taken into consideration that the carbon price also can work with free allowances? Thank you so much. Well, uh, to put it uh, uh, clear, clearly, it's not in the aim of CBAM to remove the free allocations. CBAM will adapt to the removal of the free allocations and will enter into force progressively as much as the free allocations are removed. So this is not under the competence of uh, CBAM nor of my team dealing with CBAM. It's in the competence of another directorate. It, it's another uh, legislative instrument. As, as you can see in our proposal, the two instruments cannot be at the same time in force because this would result in a double protection that we should avoid. Now, the free allowances are a risky instrument from a legal aspect, not yet uh, uh, destroyed by the WTO, but treated as an actionable uh, subsidy by the United States. On the other end, they are extremely, uh, they are impairing our climate efforts. Now, I repeat, it's not under our competence as a Digitaxud working on CBAM to decide how and when to remove them. I recognize that they help your export and I have given you in the beginning of the of this intervention, how much they help efforts. Exactly 4 billion, according to our estimate, in the first five years of application. Because if we compare a situation where you keep the free allowances fully into force in the first five years of application of CBAM, and compare with the solution that we are proposing, you will lose 4 billion of export, which is 5% of the total. So that's, uh, that's not enormous but still is something. On the other hand, as we said many times, CBAM will enter into force progressively and in the long run, leaving exporters to adapt to the new situation. So to, uh, to sum up, we don't have to decide now how to eliminate the free allowances. This will be decided in a comprehensive package under a, a political compromise in the parliament and the commission will work with that when we see the final proposal, but uh, the two things cannot be enforced at the same time, either or. So CBAM is the future, free allowances are the past. Thank you. Very clear. Uh, before I take the last question from the audience, I'm going to put another poll question to the audience. Uh, so let me pull that up now. The final poll question is, will CBAM succeed in preventing carbon leakage if it only takes into account imported goods into the EU? In other words, as it exists right now in the proposal. We'll see uh, if the panelists were able to change your minds on this one. Uh, the options are, yes, carbon intensity is mainly found in goods imported into the EU. No, an export solution is needed to effectively tackle climate leakage or you don't know or don't have an opinion. While you guys are answering that, I'm going to have a, a final question. Uh, Luke, I think this will be for you one. Uh, uh, this will be one for you, rather. Uh, give me a second, I just lost it here. Yes, so this question comes from Riley Kajaste Rudnitskaya. Uh, Luke, and, and for Luke, so how do you see overall impact of CBAM compared to ETS and other Green Deal legislation on the EU companies? So for EU companies, what's going to change when we go from an ETS with a free allowance system over to CBAM, the future, as Pasquale just said? Yeah, I think first of all that uh, we are as Yara supportive of CBAM and a lot of industries actually are supportive of CBAM. So I do follow uh, the Commission partially on the positive effects as well of CBAM. Um, and we need to find a solution to de uh, deal with uh, asymmetries in uh, carbon footprints because in a way we are as an industry phasing out of free allowances. We are building now carbon neutral installations 
these are used in the benchmark and gradually they will phase out our free allowances. Um, and initially these uh, renewable uh, production systems are paid because they actually earn free allowances, but over time they will affect the benchmark. So I think CBAM is here really important. Uh, you also mentioned a bit the wider uh, Fit for 55. I think in that context, the fundamental thing for the, the energy intensive industries remains the buildup of uh, re the renewable uh, power supply and the buildup of the renewable hydrogen production, where we also will play a role. Thanks. Uh, Eileen, I want to put this to you as well before we close uh, to get the kind of think tank perspective on this. What do you think is going to be the big change for companies going from ETS as we've known it before to the CBAM of the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the big change is the international signal that it sends. Um, I think this is actually, um, it, it, it's really kicked off, um, as Pascal also said, that there's bilateral and multilateral discussions kicked off. A, a new way of, of doing business where it's it's not just about the the product, but there's a new metric that will be that will determine your competitiveness, and that metric is the embedded carbon. And I think um, this now really allows for this new way of thinking to kickstart and to roll out internationally. Um, so yeah, that, that's uh, that's the big change I think that we're seeing. It's, uh, it's quite monumental. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Eileen. So let's pull up the answers that you guys gave, guys gave to that final poll question. So a majority of you do think that some kind of export solution is going to be needed here, 65%. However, a quarter of you think that carbon intensity is mainly found in goods imported into the EU and that uh, we shouldn't worry too much about an export solution because the main issue here is in those imports. And that leaves 9% of you that still need to be convinced one way or the other. I think what we've heard in the course of this panel is it's it's for sure a complex issue. I think especially when it comes to the legality and we know that that's going to get tricky at the WTO, uh, but that it is, it's something that companies are nervous about and particularly when we're looking at the whole supply chain and when companies are eyeing how this is going to affect them compared to their counterparts outside the EU, there are still a lot of unknowns. And of course, this is, the, this is the future. This is something that companies are going to have to be dealing with, and it will trickle down to people who work for companies, to the whole supply chains. And we'll see. We'll see what the effects are. And this is still being crafted as we speak. It's sitting with the co-legislators in the parliament and the council, and they will decide what the final version of this legislation looks like. So thank you to all our panelists for some great insights. Thank you to you at home for following along and spending your afternoon with us. Again, this is a live issue. There's going to be a lot to keep an eye on, and we certainly are going to be keeping an eye on it here at Your Active as this CBAM legislation moves forward. So thank you for spending your afternoon with us, and I wish you all a wonderful evening.